Hello and welcome to Dancer Support Mission by Sabine Chalon for Shine Your Light. Today we have a new episode of Dancer to Dancer, Words of Wisdom. And the goal of those interviews is to meet the person behind a dancer and share with you all the challenges behind the scenes and the highlights of someone's career. Truly my wish is to bring healing into the dance world, dancing to heal and healing to dance one dancer at a time and one story at a time. Today I'm very happy to have as my guest, Yorgita Dronina. Yorgita, I'm so pleased you took the time to be with me. I know you have an extremely busy schedule. So I'm, I'm really, really grateful that you made the time to be with us today. My pleasure. <laughs> So I met I met your Gita about a bit more than ten years ago, right? You actually came to Mallorca on holiday with your husband Sergey, and our husbands were friends. So we met that way uh, in Mallorca, which was quite a fun little trip I found. And I we had quite a lot of interest in common, so it was really fun. After that, we met again in Amsterdam, but I just wanted to introduce how we met. Uh, your guitar, so you, I mean, you have a lot to tell us. So let's start with, I would like to know um, where you, where and when you started dancing and why, and when you took the decision to actually make it your, you know, your career, like go for it as a career. All right. Um, I don't think there was like a light bulb saying, okay, I'm going to dance. But uh, to start from the beginning, it would be uh, me and my sister, we danced ballroom dance. And my sister was amazing at it. And, and, um, and she was getting all the medals and everything. And I was quite short, so I never had a partner. So I was dancing on the side alone at all times until it, it was enough. But that's when I think the major change happened because we had a guest warm-up teacher before ballroom classes. And that was um, a Lithuanian fav uh, a famous choreographer and, and a teacher, Eligius Bukaitis. And he spotted me and said, why, it looks like you're, you know, you have some talent in dancing and, and movement. Why don't you try ballet, basically? I had no idea what ballet is. But I was sent to do an exam, uh, you know, entry exam. And I, I was still too young for a, a, a fifth grade, like to enter the ballet school. So I tried the preparatory class. And honestly, I did not really like it very much. I found it boring. <laughs> uh, and then my mom took me to actually ballet, to see the ballet performance. And probably that's when it was a, a, a huge change. And I said, okay, this is what I want to do. It was a Snow White and Seven Dwarfs. And I wanted to be a Seven Dwarfs, all of them. And each of the characters that they were on stage. I didn't want to be a Snow White. So how old um, were you then? Uh, that was fourth grade. I was in the fourth grade. So probably around eight, nine, I would say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yes, yeah, so I left the theater, the National Ballet Theater in, in Lithuania, and I said, yes, if this is what ballet is, I want to be a seventh horse. And uh, since then, I danced, uh, as I remember at home, changing costumes to each of the characters. I was very interested in, in their characters already then, and I do remember, I have a very vivid memories of that. I was changing all the possible uh, clothing at home as a kid. To, to dance dwarfs until I, I entered actual ballet school. And then once I entered ballet school, my journey started. There was no, I didn't feel like there will be a way back. <laughs> uh, there were ups and downs, but we can talk about that. <laughs> but so this was the moment, like I, I just wanted to play the characters on, on stage. And you are and such uh, a <laughs> character, right? You are like dynamite, you know? <laughs> <laughs> You're like fire. I can really see you doing seven dwarfs at once. <laughs> so that was my beginning of my journey. So I entered the National Ballet School of Lithuania, grade five. I went to live in, live in a boarding school and never looked back, really. All right. 
And so then that leads you into your career, which has been quite um, extraordinary, actually, because you were promoted as a principal super young. And then, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I mean, I want you to tell us actually, because I think it's really interesting how, how you managed also to be part of two companies at the same time, you know, as a principal. I mean, you, you kind of invented, you know, how you wanted to, to dance really, you know, and, and in which way you wanted, you're very determined, you're very creative also in your mind with what is possible. You know, I've always admired that about you. So I would like you to explain, explain to us. I mean, you started with the Stockholm, uh, the Royal um, Swedish Ballet in Stockholm. Well, first I went, first I went to Munich Ballet Academy, which was a huge turning point for me to, to take the career internationally, to be honest, um, because I'll go a little bit back before that, because I think everything, when you mentioned determination and, and the creativity, that comes from those very early years, really. Uh, it, it's, I never felt like things were given to me, so I always had to fight for it <laughs> and invent how to, how, to, how to get where I want to get. And I think that was the main driving point, when I, the driving force when I was young. And even to go to Munich Ballet Academy was a huge challenge. And, and I faced a lot of no's, um, but I just went for it. So I, through my first competitions that I went, uh, to start that, um, you know, my, my, my early education years were not what children are exposed to today, as you understand with the internet and everything, even to get the VHS was a huge, huge, and a computer did not even I'm, I'm much older than you, so, you know, it was so, even worse. <laughs> but, but for the listeners to make it clear that to see what goes to leave the country and go to competitions. And then I was exposed to dancers and, and seeing that the different ballet schools are are are, are di they differ so much and I want to experience that and when I competition after winning men um stands were known and the Wait, living the music sorry, I think here and already they were the long way I was having some problem hearing what you just said there is some and I don't know. The sound on my part is really bad. On my end, is super good. I hear you very, very well. Okay. I don't Do know. Do you want? Um. Um. I I found the best spot for the Wi-Fi, so I hope. <laughs> um, <laughs> you believe it or not. <laughs> so let, let's just. Can you just repeat? You know about going to Munich, you know, how, because this is what you're explaining, the challenge to get out of the country, actually. Yes, yeah, so in, for my generation in Lithuania, to leave the country and go study somewhere else, it was seen as a be betrayal of your teachers and the country and school and the theater, because everybody expects to, to just join your theater. But I was not given many choices in the theater. I was already told back then that I'll just be dancing maybe um, at the best case scenario, a bluebird or a Sleeping Beauty Aurora. And, you know, the prognosis were very sad, very sad. Um, so that's where the competitions entered place in my life. I wanted to see what's out there and what other theaters are doing and how other children and back then children are dancing. And that opened my eyes incredibly. When I entered competitions and I saw that, you know what, I'm not that small and I do have something that, um, that is actually valuable in a dancer. <laughs> And, uh, and I, you know, I, I won a medal and I got a scholarship to go to Munich and I just took that chance right away. And uh, however, that was my first experience of belonging to two places because I still had to finish school in Lithuania. So I, I already shared my time back then between Munich 
and Vilnius a National Ballet School. I did exams in both places. I was traveling back and forth to, to finish my Vaganova training with my teacher, all the parody and character dancing and acting and everything, and doing my work in Munich and preparing for further competitions, which Munich helped me to go to, to Moscow and Helsinki where again, I won medals and I got uh, invitations to join companies. So I never, the good part of that, I never had to do auditions. <laughs> but this is how it started. So then I joined the Royal Swedish Ballet. I was incredibly lucky to meet, uh, that's when I, I believe in, a lot of luck, actually. It's not only hard work, but it's a lot of luck as well. Right. To meet, uh, I met an incredible director, Madeleine One, who spotted me in competitions and was so persistent in getting me to Stockholm. She literally was writing emails to dear Constance, like, please talk to your guitar. She has to join the Royal Swedish Ballet. <laughs> and, uh, and she invited me to come and see the company. So I went to Rose Swedish Ballet, I, 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 I met with Madeleine, I heard her uh, vision for me that she wants, to, uh, she wants to give me opportunities right away and, uh, and, and nurture my talent and, and, and not keep me just, you know, in a court of ballet forever and ever until it's too late. <laughs> because I don't believe that, but that's another conversation. So I was intrigued by okay i'm gonna join this company they have an amazing classical repertoire i'm gonna uh, i knew that if if i work hard and approve myself i will be nurtured and i will be given opportunities and that's exactly what happened and that's why i got promoted to principal so early i started dancing very early <laughs> yeah but still, i mean 22 is is really young right and it's i mean it's beautiful it's very exciting and then you didn't waste any time afterwards, right? So <laughs> tell us a bit more what happened after that. But I think it's exciting. Wasting time is not in my vocabulary. Um, <laughs> it's been always the drive to be efficient and exactly not to waste my time. And I don't know where I'm rushing always, but I'm always rushing. I'm always rushing to live and get the best out of everything. So as, as soon as my, our direction changed in Royal Swedish Ballet and Madeleine left and right away I felt I needed a change because I've danced all the repertoire, almost all that I could at that point and I needed to embark on a different journey. I needed experience on, a, on, on more creations because what I have experienced at the Royal Swedish Ballet is incredible classical repertoire. And, you know, only the, all the major ballets. Uh, but I did not do much contemporary. And our, uh, our former colleague, <laughs> Cedric Elias, <laughs> Cedric is a huge part of why I moved to Amsterdam, Dutch National Ballet. We met in a gala. He needed a partner. Um, I think his partner got injured or something. And... Um, and I needed a partner and we got an evening before the gala in, 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 in Italy and we clicked. We danced Grandpa Classic, as you remember, and Beauty with one rehearsal on a raked stage and we just looked at each other. <laughs> and we need to dance together and he's like, yes, I need a partner for Don Quixote in new Alexei Ratmansky's production of Don Q in Dash National Ballet. So he spoke of me to Ted Branson, and this is the way I got invited to, to dance Kitri in Don Quixote. And after my, my performances, I was offered a principal contract, and I joined the Dutch National Ballet. Wow. I took it immediately. <laughs> I took it immediately, and I never... And embark on another step of my career, which was amazing. I don't think I've danced ever as much as I danced in Dutch National Ballet. Yeah, it's a uh, factory, right? It's, it's, it can be brutal and fun. Sometimes, and, and, and 
you will uh, relate to that. You know, sometimes there were shows where you're just thrown in and barely know the steps really, and you're just doing it. And the amount of the performance, the sheer the amount of it, uh, it will be wrong to say that I was, it will be wrong to say that it took, I was never afraid to go on stage, but the experience that I got at Dash National Valley made me, taught me to improvise really, to just go on stage and dance without any fear, which I already didn't have. Um, but take it that step further of just going and not expecting anything and just doing your best and trusting my technique, trusting my knowledge, my experience, and just going for it. And, uh, and I met an incredible amount of choreographers, including one of my absolutely favorite, David Dawson, and uh, and Sidi Larby, uh, Cherkawi, and just experiencing a different side of um, creativity. Yeah, I really agree. This company is really amazing for the, for the variety of things that you can experiment there. Yes, and, uh, and then we start dancing with Cedric and traveling the world and going to a uh, different galas until he retired. And then again, timing, another amazing part of the timing is uh, the one of my uh, absolutely favorite partners, Isaac Hernandez joined the company mm -hmm. and we embarked on another journey of building a partnership. And uh, my international career really took off then. And, uh, and, working with amazing coaches as well, which again is luck yeah. that I'm, you know, like, um, we, I still call it a dream, dream team, <laughs> having I Isaac Hernandez and Guillaume Grafan being my mentor and friend and a coach. Um, so those years, I call them my, you know, almost uh, that what expelled me into, into the, the international, universe of dance and then I needed a change <laughs> <laughs> yeah. having said all of that you know I had a baby and um, and my yes, husband I remember I saw you dance <laughs> Juliet right after your first one remember I came to Amsterdam and you were like you know in between diapers and <laughs> and performing <laughs> was a crazy times and and both of us were dancing my husband and I and uh, and the schedule was um, pretty intense having said that you know he decided to retire and I was looking for a change where it would be where we would feel more home raising family mm -hmm. and uh, as he's Canadian it was a natural choice to start looking to another part of the world and so we came back to to he came back to canada and i moved to canada um to yeah. national of canada where you're you've been principal for now how many years this is the seventh season now all right fishing the seventh season <laughs> But then, while being a principal dancer with the, the, not the Dutch National, the National Ballet of Canada, you were also principal dancer, if I'm right, with English National, right, in London. Yes, the lead principal dancer, yes. Which is very easy with a child and, uh, and, and, yeah, I mean, no problem. Um, you know, always make it look like there's no problem. <laughs> People always tell me, you always make everything look too easy. I'm like, well, you know, if it looks too easy, it means it's good. It means I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying it. But, uh, of well, I'm course. teasing you because I know it's not easy. And, and that's why I want you to, to tell me what it was like. <laughs> it's, uh, it's been inspiring. And after the... Uh, as I say, after I, I called my golden years in, in Dutch National, really, really entering the mature ballerina stage, you know, um, I moved here and the, 
the season scheduling is different in North America. And uh, it was a little bit of a shock after Dutch National Ballet, where we lived in a theater, basically, you know, on stage, on stage rehearsals, on stage shows, nonstop. Um, here we have seasons. So there is a autumn season, winter season, spring and a summer. And it's, it's a long rehearsal period of time and then short season and then again rehearsal period. And I realized quite quickly that the rehearsal period of time that I need, especially in the ballets that I've danced already, I, I needed something more and to rehearse for, um, I'm being very candid and honest, right? As always, hey, that's um, to rehearse for a long period of time for a ballet that I've done. I started feeling that I, I could insert more things in there. And to start with that English National Ballet came very accidentally. Um, my long-term stage partner, Isaac, needed a partner um, at English National Ballet uh, for, Giselle or English National Ballet actually needed a, a principal dancer for Giselle and uh, I knew that he's there so I, I saw opportunity right away to reignite our partnership and uh, so Tamara Rojo, the artistic director of English National Ballet invited me to join um, as, as a principal for uh, a run of Giselle. So I went and I loved it. <laughs> I loved being in London. I loved the company. I loved her artistic approach, which how she approaches the production and how relevant she makes the classics. And that's been always, always, and always the priority in my dancing to make it relevant, to make it real, to make it actual, to make it, you know, to question a lot. A lot of that, you know, question of how do we dance classical ballet? So we really Maybe clicked on that well, song. Right? Because it's losing that sometimes, right? It becomes so uh, artificial. You have to minimize, you have to make it relevant, you have to put a lot of yourself in every role, in every classical, you know, I'll call it museum piece role. And, but that's another conversation, right? Um, that I can talk for another three hours about. So we really clicked on that front and, and I approached her and I said, look, can we, is there a possibility to even see if the seasons would overlap and match? And you know, it's been the third time that I've been so lucky because basically when my rehearsal season is here, I perform there. When I perform here, uh, the ENB would be on tour or, or would make the, the schedule work. When it's a holiday here, we perform uh, January season there. It just worked. It was magic. Like I took two seasons and they just overlapped perfectly. So I started my journey of, of, of being part of two companies and dancing with both full time. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Um, I, was, I was riding high on adrenaline. I felt like I'm living a dream. I felt like I questioned every single day. Is this, is this really too good to be true? And I did not believe that this will last forever because it was too good to be true. <laughs> uh, and then COVID happened. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about that later. I want, I want to ask more questions in between now. Um, what did you... What do you like most about dancing? Being on stage, living the characters, living on stage. So it's my little world on stage. It's like a new self, or is it, what is it? Living, living my life on stage. I don't enjoy anything as much as being on stage. This is what I feel, even in the rehearsals. I'm never, I'm never rehearsing, I'm never, in a studio the way I'm on stage. There is something that happens on stage where I just feel I explode. <laughs> so you access a different, and, uh, a different dimension or something that you cannot access if you're not on stage. That's, yeah. If that's the way to put it, yes. But so, for me, it's really so entering 
very, very unique. The world, what I feel, nobody can touch me there. Like I feel, I forget that anything else exists. I never ever dance for my coach or anything or like as soon as I enter that black box as I call it and the lights, it's my world and something happens. I I I I go to different places. And my partners have always uh, told me that somehow after the rehearsal periods and and as soon as we go on stage, you're like you become something I've having rehearsed with. <laughs> And um, so, so that's my journey. And this is why I dance. This is why I train. And this is why I do what I do is to be on stage. So <clears throat> how are you going to do when you have to leave it? Or you never leave it? You find a way to, you'll be creative enough to, you know, <laughs> to do it in a different way. The good part, I've never done only ballet right i always have different things on the side and and uh and covid has taught me a lot of that as well you know two years off stage it's it's been no joke so, so tell and, me how you experienced those two years I, how was it for you mentally physically emotionally you know and the, the actual reality of it the actual reality of it it was hard for maybe two weeks of that grieving period of oh my god what's gonna be next but um as you might know me i snap into something else um and try to keep my creativity and inspiration going so i i started doing a mentorship um online uh giving classes coaching repertoire talking about the roles about approaching the ballets with uh, aspiring artists as well as actually my my colleagues around the world and principal dancers as well mm -hmm. and giving master classes and just figuring out um how to work while being not in a studio not on stage how to keep in shape how how to keep creative how to help others and uh, I embarked into a self um, how, how to put it correctly. I um, found a lot of so self de self developing mm -hmm. process on how to be without stage and whether I can find that inspiration whether I can find to, how to keep busy uh, artistically without being on stage. So um, that led to many other things that I thought I would never do in my life, like teaching. <laughs> I thought I would never teach. I, I said that too. <laughs> Be careful when you say that. <laughs> I have changed and, uh, and I really found very inspirational to talk to a young dancers, the, um, the, the school kids, the, uh, the dancers that were about to join the companies and didn't, the dancers who just joined the companies and they lost themselves two years of their career. And uh, yeah, it was very interesting. It was very interesting work. And in order to coach and share and listen, I had to I had to teach myself a lot of things. So well, yeah, you start that was very when you start teaching, right? <laughs> it's a new dimension too. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. So that's been discovery. And uh, but yeah, if, I, to, if, uh, I, if I understood well, you also had another child in those two years. Yes. <laughs> so that kept you busy as well, maybe. Um, so, you know, I'm a planner, right? We all know. And I'm always, <laughs> so after a couple of months of pandemic, I, I saw what Europe entered because always our side of the world went a little bit later than Europe. And I saw that everything closed down and there was no 
oh, this is short term. Quite quickly, I realized this is not going to be a short term. So it was a perfect time, obviously, to just say, okay, I'm not going to be working for a year for sure. Um, we're going to have a child. <laughs> and uh, we're lucky. So we, you know, the pregnancy was, went really smooth. And, uh, and I, I kept in shape. And I got back in shape really quickly. So uh, I, I returned to work on the first week that the company actually returned to work. So I didn't feel like I missed the company work, you know. Mm-hmm. So it was perfect timing. I went when company went off and I returned when company went off. Uh, or, or, or we make the timing perfect. So that's how see it right <laughs> you make the timing perfect yeah so yes it was a it was a miracle it was a miracle too and uh right. and it was a journey so you used the word lucky i was lucky a lot do you really think you were lucky you need a little bit well first of all yeah you have to plan a lot you have to uh not waste time and then, you know, with the pregnancy, I, I do feel lucky, you know, I, I just got pregnant on the time that I decided to be pregnant. Yeah. So yes, we, my first one, I did not get pregnant immediately. So that's why I, I, I use this word mm-hmm. because uh, sometimes you want to have a family and a child and it's not happening. Yeah. So that's one of the biggest reasons I just said, okay, let's try because this would be a perfect time. And it happened. So I don't find any other word just lucky, to be honest. But of course, it's a planning as well. It's, it's taking, the, taking the time and timing and opportunity and life into your own hands and just making things work. And intention. You have a very strong intention. You, you, you look at where you want to go and this is where you want to go. I mean, this is very important because... It's one of the tools that dancers need the most, is intention, you know? Yes. Uh, it's you, very- you really master that, you know, with your, uh, with your trajectory. It's like a, a master class in, in intention. Oh, <laughs> I guess that's the way to put it. But uh, it's, it's, yes, it's that as well, that I, I know that things are not going to happen just by hoping or just sitting and doing nothing or just expecting that they will be served to me on a golden platter um i have to make things work i have to make things work and i have to see as soon as i achieve something i'm already planning something else what's the next step as soon as i achieve that next step what's next like where how much further can i take things what can i almost i I will use the word invent what can I invent to, to make things that I believe in reality? Mm-hmm. Because I, I, I do want to, I still have a lot of plans. <laughs> and I'm already on to the next projects because my head is always spinning of ideas. And I want to take our art form further. And I want to contribute to the next future generations. And there is so much work to do. And there is so much things to, to discover and enter into what hasn't been done before. That's what I'm interested. Not so just what's, through- what's your plan? Can we know or is it too early? I'm curious. It will be interesting. Um, maybe on our next conversation. <laughs> uh, I am on to something for sure. And... Uh, and something that has never been done before and something that I have discovered myself through a lot of work with myself, through myself. Mm-hmm. And uh, I want to put together, to I will spoil alert, something that I've discovered over now 17 years of my professional career. I want to make it a little bit so younger dancers don't have to go through that and they have access in, in into that experience and knowledge um in in, in a shorter summarized version <laughs> of it so artistically artistically mm-hmm. i'm talking really artistically um because i think that's not 
I believe that's not done enough. And we all talk about it. And we all talk about, um, you know, the, the being this on each end. But I don't feel, I don't feel it's taught in a way that the dancers can join the company ready to, to know how to uh, dissect the role, how to intelligently uh, make a research about the role, how to put the knowledge into the steps, into the music, into the gestures, into communication with the partner, with what's going on on stage, in time, in that period of time. Like there is a lot, there is a lot that goes on in, into, into, really, really. <laughs> right? So, so that's something um, I, I, I discovered that I'm very, I was all, always very passionate about but as a dancer it's it's still wasting while you do it on a, on a conveyor just myself right I just go perform perform and then when I have to stop I realize do others feel the same do they do the species do no do they listen to the music do they put the words and the phrasing and what the music tells you and what the uh, let's say um, literature tells you what the time tells you what the choreography tells you so it's been a lot of that going on which I realized well, wow that's I something think I'm also very passionate about it's a little bit um, you know the the old Russian ways of coaching where it was much more structured and much more meaty much there was so much more information and it's been lost more and more because, you know, I mean, even those who come to the West, they don't have the time to actually do it. You know, but when, when you were prepared for a role, you were prepared for a role. It was not just like, okay, we have two months to, to start Sleeping Beauty. You know what I mean? It was something, it was like a grooming. You know, you were picked for something, you were chosen, and then everything was being uh, uh, carved into you, you know? And, I mean, I saw that a lot in Russia. I mean, for me, that's also the only way you can actually learn a role. Otherwise, what's the point? You know, I mean, it's, that's why I, I, it's very difficult for me to really find a performance of classical ballet that I really enjoy. <laughs> you know? and, and, and God knows how much I love classical ballet. I mean, this is, you know, it's always been my my passion but it's it's very difficult right now because it's too dry it's too impersonal for me anyway i i i i agree on everything that you said it's just that i was not i didn't dance in the theater like you see i left to munich when i was 17. Mm -hmm. so what i got in school that grooming, that attention to how do you do every single variation. Already in school, I was taught that for the competition. My teacher never, I mean, we, we worked on, 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 on technique, but my teacher was always saying the priority is the, is the role, who you are on stage, how you are. So when I left, I, I entered the theater and I was a bit lost in that sense, like I was missing it. So I, until I didn't start meeting the teachers and coaches that, that guided me through that process, at the very steps, the beginning steps, I was lost. I didn't know how to do things. I didn't know how to prepare the role. And I embarked on that self-discovering. I was putting tape vhs you know the big camera with the vhs and i would record and i was like oh this makes no sense oh that thought makes no sense i'm thinking that but it doesn't show at all so how do you put that thought onto that movement and i was literally just like sitting and and then eventually from my throughout my career i was fortunate really to meet uh, to work with so many incredible choreographers and coaches uh that that proved that the, my sixth sense and, 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 and my gut is right. And, and they just, you know, they, they helped me to, 
Polish. To clean my ideas, you know. <laughs> Polish, thank you. Polish, thank you. I was looking for this word. So, <laughs> so, so, um, I was really fortunate in, in to and the coach click and we were on the same school, which again, I miss. As you say, I miss watching classical, especially classical ballet, but not only classical. Really. Um, I'm missing that one. So something that I'm passionate about, into something um, more substantial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a big subject. I hope you will create something substantial. <laughs> I, so let's, let's move on. I want, I want you to tell me what was your biggest challenge um, as a professional dancer? Oh, you're frozen. Wait. Am I? I moved the camera just a little. Just. Yogita? I'm here, I hear you very well though. Okay, well, you. oh, now that's it. Now I have you again. So could you let us know what your biggest challenge has been in your career as a ballet dancer so far? There are many. <laughs> there well, are many. One that is really, you know, the okay. meaty one. Okay, but it's, it's, it's personal, right? Like we're of course, of course, life. yeah. My experience, the, the most challenging part was always to be on top, in top shape and always ready. There was never a downtime. Um, I wasn't very good with the downtime and, uh, and the taking time off um, because I always felt, going back to the beginning of, of, of the conversation, that something might come up and then I'm not going to be ready. So I was always on that edge and that was the hardest thing to always keep myself on top. We always talk that, you know, you peak and you have to go down. Now I know that, but <laughs> that's, you know, that takes a lot of years to learn. Like there is uptime and the peak time and you have to give yourself downtime. So I was always hyper. I was always on top and to, to keep that, you know, the high note threshold was hard. That was the most challenging part. So how, I don't did, I did, how did you manage? Did you, did, you, did you figure out how to make it better or are you still, are you still I don't challenged think, by it? Um, I don't think it will ever go away. It's just, I think, part of my, just who I am and personality. And I just came to the terms to accepting that, or I'm trying to accept that. Um, <laughs> because it's, uh, it's difficult for me and it's still challenging to accept that there is a period of time where there is nothing. And it's just the way it is. And uh, it's not easy still to this day. Um, it's easier because I have a family now, so, you know, I, I, I have time with my family. It's easy in that sense because I do, you know, I have my boys and, and we spend days together and, and we do activities. I'm still not sitting on a sofa and watching TV. Forget about that. Um, so the family life has always kept me grounded, um, because I, I don't know how, but I always managed to do both and ballet and family uh, at 150 percent. So I don't, I don't feel like I, I give up either, or I, 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 I don't feel like I, I have to miss something in order to get something. I, I don't know why. I rather not sleep all for a year, <laughs> but but do both <laughs> at the full speed. So yes, it is still challenging to always be in shape, to always be on top, to always feel in shape. And, um, and I don't know if I'll ever learn to be okay with not being that. Have you ever been injured? Um, good question. Uh, I've, I had time off. 
I'll, I'll answer that way. I was forced to have time off. <laughs> um, I did not have a belly injury, if that answers the question too. I had um, something that I lost a year on my leg. I was forced to take a year off because nobody had figured out what's wrong. Um, all the uh, MRIs and scans and everything was clear. So there was not really a apparent injury or anything. Nothing really happened. But I, my calf was not responding um, after uh, a certain amount of exercise or, 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 or a workload. So I had to go to after almost a year of research and, and contenting the world's different doctors around the world, I just underwent um, exploratory surgery. And it just turned out that um, the popliteal artery was just too compressed by the muscle and too tight to the bone and it had a little release. The surgery barely will last 20, 25 minutes. I mean, but I lost a year. It could have been done much sooner. But uh, so, so that was a big, that was a big challenge mm -hmm. to just deal with the being time off and not being able to train or dance and not putting a name on the, on what's going on. Yeah. I think that's <laughs> the hardest thing. Say, oh, I twisted my foot or something. It's almost easy in that way. Right. Yeah. Uh, but, but dealing that was mentally very, very hard. And I, I, I got very, very, very out of shape which made me very, very, very <laughs> uh, anxious. And, uh, and it was hard to deal with. When was that? That was, uh, that was 2019. Wow. Okay. Then I got back after surgery. It took literally the stitches went off uh, and from the hospital i literally went to the studio <laughs> i was back in no time i was back in no time uh very quickly i prepared the uh, romeo and juliet the full and ballet in alexey ratmanski's romeo and juliet and on my stage call the theater closed oh, i'm sorry yeah i was uh, i was in the you know the hair ready and everything did my class was ready to go on stage and the company announced that we're closing because due to covid and um, pandemic so that was uh, from one year to another two years but again even that even pandemic was not as challenging on me mentally as that year where i was just in a limbo of having no idea yeah what I'm dealing with and what's going on and why nobody's doing anything to help me. <laughs> um, so I took, you know, I took the, I took life again in my own hands and I, I was very proactive and I contacted a lot of people looking for answers. And I went, uh, thanks to Tamara Rojo and, you know, and, and the new medical team that English National Valley had, um, they took an incredible care of me and I went to London and I was I was just like just open it and see what it is <laughs> um, can, you, can, you just, can you just see it as a maybe it was a, also a gift for you to stop you know I mean because you're it, there's so much you know happening and it I mean on the little body like this I mean I know you're su superhuman but it's like maybe it was needed for your body to stop physically <laughs> I think this is the only thing that I'll disagree. I physically really struggle. So I think the pandemic, I had a, I have a very healthy approach when pandemic hit mm -hmm. because I, my body was, you know, healthy and strong and I could continue uh, just by doing, you know, belly bar in, in my basement and continue the gym training with the weights that I bought and teaching and this, like that was my healthy approach because the time off that I was given, I knew that it's given to me and I'm not in control of it. So then I can let go and see how can I use this time. 
Mm-hmm. When I'm dealing with something that I'm not in control of, but I don't know how long, what it is, there is no, there is no name to put on it. There was nothing that I've done like to my leg or like it was, you know, at the end it was just bloody tightness. And uh, I can see how this must be extremely challenging. I mean, that was, that was extremely challenging and I did not see it. And I still not see it at this point as that, Oh, maybe it was a good time to rest that year messed up with my health a lot. Mental health, you know, mental health that I, I, I always thought that the next month is I'm going to be back. There was no time frame that I could see up front and structure my time off. Like it was just from MRI to x-ray to let's do the um, uh, um, um, one test, the other test, let's see one doctor, let's write emails, let's, let's contact Australia, let's contact London, let's contact San Francisco. Like, that was, it's just nerve wracking. And at, at the end I was just down and I was not able, at 3 a.m. I was not able to sleep. Like I, I felt like I'm gonna have a panic attack. And I mean, I, I, I exaggerate, but the thoughts that go through your head, that is not something that you can predict or have control of, it's the worst thing. Mm-hmm. So, so going back to the biggest challenge, when you dance or, or, or when I'm in, in the season, it's I'm facing one challenge is, you know, how to keep in shape, how to keep injury free, how to keep training. It's just, it's surrounded about working. Any challenge you have, one has or I have, it's surrounded about working, preparing for the role, preparing for the show, how, how to prepare for a certain role in the healthiest way, how to keep injury free. But that year was just horrible. <laughs> It was horrible. It was like tackling the unknown, right? Nobody had answers. That's the worst part of it. Until I, I didn't just, you know, sign the paper saying, you know, ex- exaggerating, saying, you know, I'm signing my own wording. I'm like, just cut it open and see what it is. <laughs> I'll do it myself. Give me the knife. <laughs> another year of my career for what for nothing it looked like nothing to me and in all honesty at the end it was nothing I just wish it would have been done earlier but anyway so (laughs) okay so I'm gonna ask you a few more questions because we're almost at the end of um um If we go back to your student years, you know, is there anything that knowing what you know now, you would have done any different? I mean, in terms of, you know, approaching things and behavior, I don't know, the way you apprehend your work and everything, would you, would you change anything if you could go back in time? It's always difficult because I wish I would have known many things. But on the other hand, I don't think I could have known them in the city that I grew up, right? So it's always difficult to blame someone knowing that they had no knowledge neither to help me. So my path took the turns it took because I was experimenting and I was searching for answers and I was trying to just be the best version of myself. But that is a lot of um, self-discovery and again, uh, uh, hit and miss things, right? So, of of course, I wish that's been always made, you know, the teachers that uh, were teaching us they didn't know knowledge neither so where do i have it from like now internet is full of of um, specialists and experts and and you can talk to people and to uh, and get that coaching you know that is so crucial to a ballerina and and actually a student let's let's say student in the early 
uh, I didn't know that. So even to blame my teachers, I, I cannot, you know, my, my conscience is not going to allow me to do that. So I wish I would have known more about nutrition, but I didn't. I, I wish I, I would have known. I mean, again, naturally I was very determined. So I, 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 th I think even I would have known some things, I would still have done the same mistakes. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, certain things you learn with the experience and yeah. one, yeah. and I don't believe in overprotecting. Uh, I mean, I'm a mother of two now as well. And I don't believe in overprotecting your, your children, your students by not experiencing a certain things that I experienced. Mm -hmm. Of course, the world was different, and um, I went through a lot of verbal abuse uh, in, in my school years. So I wish that wouldn't happen because I would have had a healthier relationship with myself. Uh, uh, be the way I am, just attacking things and, and looking for things and uh, and uh, have that drive that I had as a 17, 16 year old, uh, really risking and, and, and leaving everything and, and, and going for the unknown if, if, if I would have not had that. So I'm not saying that was right at all. No, but but there's also, it's also important to, to, you know, to say what you're saying is that there's nothing like experience anyway. So, you know, and you could not turn back in time and then change everything you want to change, but something else would probably, you know, come up, you know, that you wouldn't think about. So I, it's nice to also be able to hear it and, you know, for you to express it, right? I do believe there is, a, and especially now in in today's world the ballet world has come so much ahead in terms in in terms of the healthy teaching healthy approach to conversation to not being uh, afraid to speak to question like i did not grow up like that so every word i said was uh, 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 used against me and, and and like i'm not allowed to question or talk or 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 you know so i i faced a lot of uh, negativity in terms of that so i'm amazed and and i'm so thankful how the ballet community in, in the world has come to actually have a conversations with students to talk to 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 listen to them you know like each human being has their own op opinion, first of all, and, and a way of seeing things, and, and it's important to be heard. But the, my, my main probably, I wish, if I will go back, I wish I would have known what children and kids do know now in terms of nutrition. I think that's been, uh, I think I wasted 10 years of my career for sure, experimenting <laughs> until, I, <laughs> I until I figured things out. And then, you know, and then I realized, oh, there are specialists who are actually dealing with this. Oh, amazing. You know, let's ask their opinion. And, you know, 10 years passed meanwhile. meanwhile. So I think that's the only thing. That's the only thing that I, I, I wish. The rest, um, I don't think uh, my school where I grew up, you know, even knew that there is a, you know, Pilates or weight training or gyrotonics or, or, or nutrition or massages or physio or osteo. So I cannot say that I wish because it didn't exist back in the day. So children are lucky now. I think they're super yeah, lucky. But it's, it's just realizing where we come from and where what we can expand into, right? And what we can bring, you know, what would be the ideal conditions? But as you say, I mean, you know, like a dancer is like a rough diamond, right? It needs, needs a little bit of pressure and heat to, <laughs> to shine. So it's like finding a balance. You know? That's another thing. 
what you mentioned is brilliant. How do you find the balance? You can, I feel like I come from that generation where I wouldn't imagine coming from my, from Lithuania into an international career, like not having the big school name behind me, not having any name behind me or being really feeling like you are no one in a big universe. You're like, just, I felt like, like this, no one, <laughs> like a star in the sky, you know, like just one of a trillion million. Well, a star and, in the sky is not no one. It's no, but you know what I mean? <laughs> but you see, you know what I mean? Yes. Just when you go at the universe, one student like just trying to achieve something, I felt like I'm no one, that I need. So I, 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 I need to look for things to realize myself, to realize my dreams, to, to go for things. So, and that pressure helped. I'm not that's, that's your uh, drive not abuse pressure I you know I had to, to do a lot of work in my head <laughs> and we have spoken about that before to overcome that mm -hmm. to overcome that uh, trauma really which kids you know don't have thankfully in schools now but how do you maintain that balance of a little bit of pressure but there at the same time, not saying that everything is beautiful, everything is great, and we're all beautiful and we're all wonderful. <laughs> that's definitely that's definitely what I want to work on, I mean, and that's what I would tell my student. I said, "Listen, I'm not gonna code it in sugar or something. I mean, you want to dance? You've chosen that. There's no other way around than working super hard and giving it your your six hundred percent." That, that's not my rules, that's the rules of the profession you chose. And I think the secret is to make people understand that they do it for themselves. They don't do it for me, they don't do it for anybody else. You had your drive and this is what propulsed you through, you know, brick walls. And I mean, I, I was like this too in a way, you know, but when people ask me, how did you stay, you know, uh, motivated, I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know. I didn't look for motivation. You know, it was, it was, I had fire under my, my popo, you know, and, and this is what I'm, if I teach anything to my student, it's like, you just have to know why you're doing this. And if your whys are not strong enough, then I cannot do anything for you. That's but amazing. They have to find that inside them, inside them. I mean, it's not for everybody too. I mean, you know, we're not all the same. We're all very different. So I, I, I think this is, and, and this is the, the dynamic in a, in a ballet class changes completely when you, when you set that boundaries. You know, you're like, listen, I'm gonna, I can help you to go really far. I can, I can kick your ass to move mountains, but only if you ask me to. Yeah. Then it changes everything because yes, we're gonna go for the work, honey. I mean, because I know what it takes to go there, but but you give me permission. I'm not gonna beat you with a you know <laughs> with a hammer. We're gonna that's do it together, and that thing. changes everything. Your students are really lucky, but as a child, I could not even imagine saying what you are saying like to hear that from my teacher. I was the one pushing and I was the one fighting and I was the one saying that it's not good enough and I was the one saying, but on the other hand, if, if, if I turn back the time, I think the teacher seeing that kind of child like I was, super stubborn and super fiery and, and super, critical on, 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 on myself because I knew that I'll have no life at all or, or any future if, if, if I'm not like that. I wouldn't add to increase the fire because that leads, that's where the balance is. That leads to problems. No, if no, you but, have, but do, yeah. and then you understood me wrong because this is no, no. that you said the, 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 I mean, the rules, but you, that's the whole point is that somebody who is like you, you have to pull them back because otherwise they eat themselves, you know? And that's the balance. It's like, 
you see all those people, you, you see how everybody's so different. So you're not going to teach anyway the same for the same seven girls or eight yeah. girls or nine girls. But that's the whole point, actually. It's like, if you see that you have someone who doesn't need this push, you know, that's the other thing is like, make them understand how they function, make, make them become a little bit friendly to themselves because eventually, you know, at the end of the day, this is what you need. Is uh, you, you need to be your own support system and your own friend, you know? And, and it's, I, I know that we need to push, we need to do all this, we, but we have to have a healthy relationship with ourselves. And we have to be able to look at it, uh, at ourselves critically, but not, 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 not with a, with a knife, you know, it's like, let's, let's put things on the table and, and let's put things in, in perspective as well. You know, so there's two sides of this and you have to juggle with this the whole time because most people like you, you know, of course you will never be lazy. And, you know, even if you are, we won't see it. You know what I mean? No, but it's true. It's true. But, but it shows even, you know, when you start seeing people the way they're, it's, it's fascinating, you know, it's absolutely fascinating to, to See, teach I wish people. I, would have known that. And? I wish I would have known that. Your students are lucky. I wish I would have known that. Well, because <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's about 10 years of my career where you go against yourself. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> that's, you know, and that's when it becomes uh, never enough. Anything you do is never enough. You always want more. You always want more. It's never good enough. It's never good enough. But is it a problem or is it a positive thing? That's it's both. The... It's both. Yeah. I mean, and I was going to say, one quality is your fault as well. You know, it's, it takes, it's, it's all it's about keeping the balance, right? And it's never right when something is there and the other one is there. So it's always about going like, okay, I need to put myself into balance again, because this is where it's going to flow. You know, this is what so, you find when you're on stage. There's this flow because, because it's, it's beyond you, right? It's, uh, it's your essence that needs to come out. <laughs> it's, it's always spiritual. Like that's the thing on stage. There is no, no that going against yourself, right? You're free that freedom i don't know there is a something that's one that's that's why one has to have or find like yourself like you found a passion that keeps the same spiritual or or whatever dance is to a, a particular person you have to keep the same i'm trying to find the same essence in whatever i'll do next because if this stage experience elevating freeing is it what makes me live you know like just i, I feel alive I had, I had the same question as you because i felt exactly the same free stage was freedom for me and i was like a different person i mean i was a, i was a, a different being you know I, I was it was it was expansion and this is what i loved so much and i thought I'll never find anything that will mass, I mean, that will get at that, that level. And then I started to do the inner work. And I understood what I was looking for in doing, in getting this. You know, I was trying to grab onto something that I, that was not palpable, right? Mm -hmm. But when you realize, when you start going inside, it's all there. <laughs> But it's a long process, you know, and it's, it's, it's a dismantlement also of the ego, you know, the, the personality, because we are a construct as well. But that, I mean, that we need definitely another, another discussion about this. <laughs> if I start. But, but I completely understand what you're saying. And I, and I know that what you're looking for, it's inside of you. If you take the time to take a deep breath and, and sit with yourself, you will find it. But your essence is there. I mean, it's so bubbly, so. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've seen me at my worst and my, at my best, probably, at the same time. Yeah, because it's, it's the same, same coin. 
you cannot have the best if you don't have the worst in a way, you know? So I would say, okay, your biggest quality is also your biggest fault. And then they go like, what? And I said, well, let's think about it. And so your biggest fault is also maybe your biggest quality. And we have to just, you know, again, it's a bad balance. And dance is not, nobody's teaching balance, you know, people are going like this, you know, and thinking that, yeah, maybe it's part of it. And, and, and I was very focused and I was very fanatic, you know, so I know what it is. So I can bring something else now that I've, you know, stepped out of this. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an eternal question always, you know, what's, would we be who we are if we wouldn't have what we have overcome, right? If, if somebody, would put me as a 10 year old in a different setting in a different school in a different setting would i have had a life that i'm having would i be so stubborn like head forward and traveling and and and, and making the impossible possible we don't know that it's the no, question that i'll never be answer but yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. I, I never ask myself this question for some reason. <laughs> because, because it's not about, yeah, I mean, I, I actually love the path that I took. And I think it's fascinating. So I think, you know, in this lifetime, this is what we're supposed to be. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I guess. We'll see. <laughs> Okay, Yogita, I don't want to keep you too long because we've gone over the hour already. I just want to ask you a very quick last question and you're going to make it very quick, I, a quick I know, just to summarize the whole thing. What would be the best single advice you would give to someone who starts their career now? Go for it and don't be afraid. Oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> Press your gut feeling, go for it. And... Uh, sometimes that's all one needs to take that next very important step and if you and take every opportunity that comes along that's a, another one because many many the stories that we talked about mm -hmm. if that one email i would have said oh no sorry i'm too busy i have this i have that would yeah. never lead me to another thing so every opportunity is golden you might regret taking it there will be another one that you won't regret so just take it Go I for it. That. I think that's beautiful to just finish with this. That's wonderful. Okay, Yogita, thank you so much for giving me your precious time. And uh, I wish you uh, a beautiful uh, end of the season because I know you're busy. You just did beauty, I saw. And um, so, what is next for you? Just for us. Sorry? New, um, uh, it's a new world premiere at uh, Swan Lake, directed and staged by Karen Kane. So we're working on a brand new Swan Lake with the, uh, this is my 10th version of Swan Lake. Wow. And I'm so inspired to see it differently and have different ideas and make new sense to every step again and again and again. And um, it's super inspiring. Wonderful. I wish you the best as a better deal in that new adventure. Thank you. It's been really, really nice and, and inspiring talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>